And our first speaker is going to be Joan Simmons. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the use of activity monitors with young people uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalitis, and it was a pilot study. Now, would anyone like me to explain what chronic fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalitis is? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, one brave person. Um, this is what used to be very, um, in a very mean way, used to be called yuppie flu. So it was a post-viral thing, and uh, what uh, it, it just knocked these young people for six, and it actually can go on for years and years. And I will actually explain a little bit more about it. But um, they shorten it, as you can imagine, to CFSME, and that's what it's called um, on the whole. Okay, uh, so it can affect anyone. Uh, it's estimated that it affects about one in 300 people in the UK, possibly more, because there's not a lot of research in this area. Um, children, the most common age is 13 to 15, so just slap bang when teenagers are kicking off to be actually, you know, develop as teenagers. Um, but it can, it can happen earlier. It's estimated there's nearly 25,000 young people are affected in the UK. And Crawley showed that one in 100 children uh, enrolled in school have missed up to 20% of school due to CFSME. So quite a drastic impact on school. There are three most common symptoms, fatigue, uh, which can result in utter exhaustion, and I'll show you that in some of the young people we talk to, to the point of collapse. Pain, particularly headaches, uh, intense muscle and joint pain, and these can be difficult to relieve with painkillers. And then cognitive impairment, and this is what people sometimes call brain fog, so they actually can't remember what's going on, can't take um, instructions very well. You might say that's the average teenager, but this is actually in an extreme. So... The impact, as you can imagine, on those characteristics on a teenager is actually huge. Um, as I said, there isn't a lot in young people uh, research, but a study done uh, in adults uh, by the charity Action for ME indicated that the cost to the nation is approximately £6.4 billion a year. That's pretty substantial. Um, as I said, there's none, no data like that for young children, but it's uh, likely to be proportionally high. Uh, and there's no known cure. CFSME, although treatment may help these symptoms. So the specific treatments, apart from medication, which I'm not going to go into, are cognitive behavioural therapy and graded exercise therapy. And graded exercise therapy is the focus, really, of what I'm looking at this afternoon. So it means a gradual, as it, can, as it says in the name, uh, a gradual progressive increase in exercise or physical activity, usually walking. Uh, the level of exercise recommended will depend on the individual's symptoms and current level of activity. And graded exercise is tailored to suit each individual case. So they usually are looked after by a physiotherapist who sees them regularly, how they're doing, increase of maybe 10%, and very gradually increase to the point where they're having what would be a normal level of exercise. So ideally... Um, uh, supervised by a physiotherapist and one of the people that I did this study with uh, was called Glenda Dalton and she was a highly specialised physiotherapist, that was her title and she specialised in CFSME. So it's been shown to improve symptoms, however, in the case of young people with CFSME, there are anecdotal reports that patients and carers can be resistant or even hostile to the use of uh, graded exercise therapy and one of the mums we actually, uh, in, I interviewed um, at the end of this study, said um, that uh, we're going to write to someone to say this doesn't work and uh, we've, we've got a case for shredding the data on graded exercise therapy. And I went away thinking, I'm not, that, that lady's very unhappy about this, but I think she had much more issues than the actual graded exercise therapy, which didn't work for her daughter. Um, some support groups have voiced concern that the therapies are too hard on young people. And if you think about it, if you've got a, a young person who is at the point of collapse and you've got a physiotherapy therapist saying, walk for five minutes, in a week's time walk for ten minutes, build it up, build it up, and the parent's looking at the physio saying, he can't get out of bed, he can't walk to the toilet, you would want me to get him to walk for five minutes. So there's that very difficult negotiation going on all the time with getting buy-in from the young person then the parent who has to watch them and pester them to do this exercise. So it's a very tricky relationship all around in those three um, particular people. So it raises the question whether there's any form of support that might be made available to help improve adherence to a graded exercise therapy plan. And addressing this question is the focus of the pilot study. 
So Milton Keynes Hospital approached the OU to undertake a study uh, to look to see if uh, young people were wearing activity monitors and they had an objective set of data to say how much activity they'd done, would it help with adherence to the graded exercise therapy plan. And so this is a report of a year-long pilot study. We had five young people and their parents um, that we actually collected data on over a year. So the activity monitor we used were the Fitbit Zip, which is that little one you can clip on, clip on, on, on belts or, or um, clothes. And all, then we did move from when um, there was requests for something that could measure sleep, because sleep is a particular problem with CFSME. And so we also um, supplied the Fitbit charge. This wasn't a funded study, apart from the fact that the OU funded it. So uh, we had to go away. <laughs> we had, I even have a file saying, please, could we have a Fitbit? So we actually had letters that we had designed specially saying, could we have more Fitbits? Because we had one lot, and then we had to go back and get more. So five young people and their parents. We had initial interviews, um, followed by wearing the Fitbit for a year, up to a year. More interviews at the end. And throughout the year, Glenda, the physiotherapist, collected uh, data from all of the appointments that she had with the young people during the year. So the young people, and these are pseudonyms, were Bethany, Zara, Michael, Ethan, and Fraser. Fraser. And I have uh, two teenagers, so I, think, I was thinking, these are, these are teenager -y names. I um, haven't listened to um, friends, because I was thinking, in my day, you never met a Bethany, Zara, Ethan, or Fraser. Anyway, Bethany was 17 years old, and she developed CFS in me following the HPV vaccine. And this was a very striking exa example of uh, the perception of how this happened. And uh, this young lady said, I can tell you to the day when I actually got CFSME. It was three weeks after she'd had the HPV, vac HPV vaccine, uh, and this was nearly four years ago, and she was still having um, daily issues with it. So initially diagnosed with post-viral fatigue, went from being someone who danced since the age of two and represented school in athletics to sleeping all day, no school attendance, then not sleeping at night. So in her entire life was turned upside down from somebody, uh, imagine how active she would have been um, representing the school in athletics to actually not being able to get out of bed. So she started physio and medication to help her sleep at night and she still takes that four years on. Uh, physio has helped um, and she said we've gradually increased um, school hours to 13 hours a week and have got her through her GCSEs. So what did the physio say? Over the year, these are the physio's comments. So um, by January, uh, Bethany was wearing the, the Fitbit for six months and set steps target at 3,000 with a view to increase 10% and this has worked. By March, set back due to school pressures and family bereavement, baseline reset to 2,000. And this was the story all the time, back and forth, back and forth. Um, Bethany had reached 4,000, so reduced by half due to setback. The Fitbit has been a good way of opening up discussions in an objective way. And that was one of the key things the physio started, stated was, I, get, I, I think young people are telling me what they want me to hear. If I had the data from the Fitbit as a point of discussion, it would be easier than actually them trying to tell me what I wanted to hear. Uh, November, Bethany had left school and is going to start an apprenticeship, feels better without the stress and pressure of school and will restart her baseline at 3,500 and will increase by 10% every three to four days. So the physio's view of using the um, Fitbit was, I think it's been a useful discussion point for Bethany and in some way has increased her communication with me. Initially, her mother would share the data with me through email, but now Bethany does this and has been attending physio sessions on her own. So quite a helpful way for the physio to move on in, in her relationship with um, the young person. Uh, so Bethany herself said, we started 2,000 steps, went up gradually by 500 steps or something for every couple of weeks. Now she says, if I had a bad day and I look at the steps I've done, I'm like, oh, okay, I've had a bad day because I've done 15,000 steps. Like many of us would do. I wouldn't do 15,000 steps on a normal day. Whereas before I knew it, it was before, I knew it was I'd had a bad day because I'd done too much. It's just a bit more specific. And it was almost like this biofeedback. So they need, they, and anyone who wears a Fitbit, you only have to wear it for a couple of months to have an average so you know what a normal day gives you, what a, a busy day gives you, and what a very quiet day gives you. And I can imagine after a couple of months, you could stop wearing a Fitbit, and that wouldn't change over time. 
Um, and then she said, I'm still a bit boom and bust, uh, in a bit of boom and bust phase. I'm still a bit doing five lessons one day in year 13, then the next day I can't go in because I've done too much. So I need to manage that a bit better. And that was the, bit, the Fitbit was helping with that. Um, so my, the second young question was Zara. Um, and, and this was a more complicated young lady than Bethany. Uh, she start, it started with flu tonsillitis type infection at the end of February last year, then di diagnosed by the end of June. And she had the view that um, graded exercise therapy was a positive thing, it was to help manage, manage symptoms. And it was Zara's mum who didn't see it as a treatment and was very tricky about using CFSME and said, we don't use, uh, um, we don't call it ME, we call it CFS. She was quite picky about what, what it was called and said, graded therapy is not a treatment. And so had very, very fixed views about things. But I think there was a lot more complications going on in their family life. Um, and during the, the school holidays, she was almost normal, then caught a cold and just crashed, really. So this idea of going back and forth was, was uh, quite a lot of the stories. I'm going on to Sarah. Um, the idea of wearing the Fitbit, I think making the graded exercise as part of my daily routine, then it would just come naturally and I would just remember it. Um, and she says, I'm not on screens a lot because it makes me tired because that's a high energy activity. Um, getting a new gadgety thing is going to be cool. Why not? Especially if it's free. Um, <laughs> it wasn't free, but it was free to her. Um, I've got into the hang of getting into bed by the, at least 8.30 with lights out by 9, so my sleep's okay. So you can imagine, this is a young teenager going to bed at half eight at night. That was how it was affecting um, her life. So what did physio say? Um, in October, and by this time, um, Zara would have been wearing it for three months, very low mood, seems to be deteriorating, not grading exercise, not confident in managing condition, and not confident in healthcare professionals, struggling with anxiety and panic attacks. And then by March, she wasn't seeing Zara very much, and that this deteriorated over time um, until in August, now under the treatment with a specialist unit, an approach will be through psychology, not doing GET, not using Fitbit. And so this young person, uh, became uh, deteriorated considerably and as you can imagine parents were there when they were at that point felt that the treatment wasn't helping they sought other help so this was an example of going to a specialist unit elsewhere and the specialist unit then drew a line on actually using the physiotherapist at, at Milton Keynes Hospital and just moved on. So one year on um, Zara when we asked her she said Fitbit wasn't very accurate used for six months, but my brother uses it now. He loves it. Uh, I'm doing my DOV bronze in a wheelchair. So that's where she was a year on, which was um, quite sad to see. Michael, we, the, our next young man, uh, he had CFSME from the age of 11, very poorly. Um, he was, uh, they put it down to stress because it happened just after he'd started secondary school, but mum knew it wasn't. Um, and what the really difficult thing parents often have is getting CFSME diagnosed because it's so vague. They're just tired. They won't get out of bed. Well, a lot of teenagers don't want to get out of bed, but this is extreme. And mum was saying, I, I was absolutely petrified that he was not going to get better because no one would help with it. So quite difficult. Um, then they met Glenda, the physiotherapist. She supported them through, put things in place on a day-to-day -day basis just to keep going. Graded exercise was introduced and um, managing the symptom was, I think you have to pull it back and go to bed earlier every night. I'll get the huff and he'll do it and he'll feel better. Don't get me wrong, I don't get, yeah, mum, you're right, mum, thanks for that. So typical teenage relationship going on in the middle of all this difficulty of just getting them to get um, well. And then, but I do think you have to be quite a strong parent to keep them within their boundaries. And the Fitbit did help the mums and dads to actually see what was going on rather than nagging the young person and perhaps not believing them in the amount of exercise they said they were doing. So um, Michael, he said, I used to be the fastest at running short distance and long distance at my school. I was also the best of team at 10K swimming. But when he got CFSME, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move out of bed. I couldn't move in bed. So dramatic, you know, this idea of crashing completely. So he was um, diagnosed and uh, gradually started working with Glenda, increasing his exercise. Um, and, but when it came to school, he had to start one hour a day, built it up over five weeks to five hours a day. And that's actually where he was at when we were talking to him. And he says, looking back, he missed three quarters of year seven, which set me back quite a bit. 
So at the beginning, I was saying it was 6.4 billion was the uh, monetary impact of CFSME for adults across the NHS. But in actual fact, look at the cost uh, psychologically, socially to these peop young people's lives. It's much more than monetary. So the physio, um, initially, Michael started with a clip, but then went on to um, uh, the wrist one, which is the charge. And he, uh, by September, was doing maximum steps of 13,000 and a min minimum of 4,000. And that's something that Glenda wouldn't want. She'd want it to be much more stable. And so the Fitbit showed when he was doing too much and when he was doing maybe more or less the right amount. Um, by February, he had been unwell, not self-managing due to illness. But March, really helpful data received about sleeping, checking vitamin D levels and start of medication to aid sleep. And you know yourself, if you're not sleeping, everything goes wrong from there. Because in actual fact, you start the day exhausted, you feel pretty erratic, you're not concentrating very well. But the Fitbit, because we swapped to the Fitbit charge, it monitored sleep. And it showed how many times they woke up during the night, how many hours of sleep they got. And just by identifying that, and um, one of the things with CFSME is that the vitamin D can be very low and that impacts on sleep. So they could address that straight away and it did make a difference. So by April again, he'd been quite unwell. Uh, and in July, physio's observation was rather than giving a young person an activity plan while building up school attendance, it might be more worthwhile aiming for full-time school. And in a sense, that is, if you're a young person, that is the major part of your life, attending school. And if they're attending school, they are having a very specific level of activity, even on the minimum for that standard day. And the plan activity program counts steps for 10 minute walk, increasing by 25% every week in two or two in order to walk for 30 minutes. I'm just conscious of time now. Um, Looking back, Glenda said, probably was helpful to see how many steps Michael did at school and very useful with understanding sleep. The Fitbit could now be useful in taking activity to the next level and recording running would be useful. So um, uh, I don't think there's much more. To, I'm going to go on to Ethan. Um, he had symptoms for two and a half years, could barely walk from his bed to toilet. Same sort of, you know, scenario. Um, but mum was saying he's 15 so you know you've got the attitude and that as well and this was the layer of complexity that all the time when we talk to the young people when we talk to the parents was what is the teenager experience that's actually um, influencing things going on here and what is CFSME impacting um, school was very difficult mum said threatening to take mum to court over Ethan's absences so the layers of um, negativity are outstanding really um, and Ethan himself, he said, I figured out I had CFS in me over a year ago. I've been going for lots of tests, lots of blood tests, and seen lots of doctors. Um, but he said, graded exercise therapy has helped a lot. It helped build me back up where I thought I used to be. It started with go for a five-minute walk and gradually increase. I'm doing 15 to 20 minutes now. I stick to most of it, to it most of the time, but I definitely do go over. And the physiotherapist, in November, he was unwell. In January, he had surgery. Uh, but in April, 29,858 steps in a week. Average uh, was 4,265. Didn't have a day off school last month. And sleep, getting the re recommended nine hours of sleep. So he'd been unwell in November, but slowly and gradually by April, he was doing really, really well. I'm going to go on to Fraser. Um, He'd been sick for 18 months by the time we met him. Um, but again, when they met Glenda, they just praised her out of, out of all proportions. Um, she just, they just said she was wonderful. But because she was this highly specialised physiotherapist, she knew where they were coming from. She understood them. And they actually, she gave them confidence in her care. Because what's not in here is the absolute nightmare these parents and young people had in getting diagnosed and one young lad said um, when they went he was unwell went to A&E and when they explained what was wrong with him the nurse laughed that she just laughed at the idea that anyone had chronic fatigue and that was that was an issue and um, it made um, obviously the young person and mum very angry um, mum was saying about Fraser I think he's quite disillusioned about how long it's going to take like we said at the beginning there isn't a cure uh, he doesn't do his physio unless I remind him, which can involve a lot of moaning when he's tired. His main challenge is recognising when he's tired, and then I have to work out, work out, is it just because he's a teenager, or is it because he's tired? And in relation to the Fitbit, he is motivated by technology, as he likes all gadgets. So he, Fraser explained about being tired and the whole thing. Fitbit, I'll probably be pleased to show my friends I've got a Fitbit. No one else has, so I don't mind. I'm quite open about this. And mum says, she helps me a lot with everything. So that was quite nice. He did recognise it. 
So again, a whole um, lot of information about the activity. Um, and by December, Fraser has been spending more time out of the wheelchair at school. Now building up functional activities, but still aims for 5,500 steps, increase of 10,000, 10% on last activity log. Um, and she said, I think Fraser appears more confident increasing activity and time out of the wheelchair. He's building in a graded, controlled way. The Fitbit has helped to achieve consistency with activity across the week. And that's something that they just didn't have. So you could have this five minutes of walking or five minutes of activity, but the steps actually helped uh, considerably. Now, with Fraser, there was no follow-up interview. They just simply declined to be invited, uh, declined the invitation. So you can think, you know, we've done well to have um, the first one. So I'm on my last, I think my second last slide. So looking back over the year, what the physio, because it was a physio who came to us and said, we'd like to do this study. I'm very interested. I want to get this data. She said it helped with objectivity of discussions with, with um, the young person and the physiotherapist. It helped with the boom and bust and how to avoid both. It provided information for a baseline of activity that could be gradually built on. Uh, it identified sleep problems and enabled this to be dealt with. It provided information that the physiotherapist described as useful. It was factual and objective, and it helped open up discussions. And for parents, as you can imagine, who, who said several times, I have to nag them, I have to moan them, I have to moan at them, I have to remind them. They said it helped them to have confidence in the amount of activity their young person was doing. And for one, it took the pressure off. Any questions? Sorry, it was a rattle through. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, in terms of what it is actually counting as the steps and what generates that step. So how did you address that need and what the physiotherapist? Because there's a lot of talk about how the Fitbit provided this sort of uh, more objective sense of data that was useful to parents, physiotherapists, and obviously to these young people. Yeah. Uh, how we addressed it was, it was more um, acute, I'd say, when it was a young person who was maybe only doing 500 steps to start with. So those 500 steps, it was really important that it didn't say 800 or 1,000 when it, they needed to say 500. And so the wrist-based ones were actually the ones that were incredibly inaccurate. Um, some of the young people used to do knitting as part of um, an exercise that you know, occupied them. I'm not sure where knitting came into it, but several of them were doing knitting. And of course, if you're knitting, you could be racking up lots of supposed steps. So in those cases, they went back and went to the Fitbit zip and actually clipped it onto their um, belt uh, or their clothes, and that was actually help more helpful. Any more questions, anybody? I'm interested in the data that you collated about sleep, because my son has autism and he doesn't sleep, okay. and a Fitbit was recommended, but we never actually got one, and yeah. I wondered how that data was used and how it benefited the child. Uh, how it was used was it showed how many times they walk during the night, and so it gave an idea of what quality of sleep there was, and it showed times that they were asleep and times when we were awake, they were awake. And for somebody who might go to bed at half eight and get up at you know nine o'clock the next morning, they might only have had six hours sleep, but they're actually in bed for eleven and a half hours. So um, that was what it did, and what it did, and what Glenda then responded to, in that, how she responded to that was because lack of sleep was a known entity in CFSME. Um, the, the normal approach was to give vitamin D because I, I think there was a connection of low vitamin D that affected their sleep in CFSME and in a number of them they had um, sleep medication. Okay. I think I've taken up all my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is um, Elizabeth Tipp uh, who will be starting talking in a minute. Okay, I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Lisbeth Tip. I'm a clinical psychologist and I currently work as a research assistant and, and do a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, but I've worked with uh, loads of patients over the years um, and mostly use cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and for those of you who um, yeah, uh, know what that is about, um, people get a lot of homework. Uh, they have to monitor. Um, yeah, certain behaviors or thoughts as to be able to change it. And um, 
uh, yeah, a while ago I came into contact with uh, some colleagues at some uh, Sandpit event uh, where the university was doling out money to people who wanted to work cross-disciplinary. Uh, and I teamed up with two researchers from social and political sciences. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, a bit of the project, that is the, the clinical psychology part, but it's in a general population. Uh, because we were all interested in anxiety um, and um, yeah, for the people in social and political sciences um, that also had to do with you know, when you're anxious, we, we were all wondering could it have a positive effect when you're anxious and you monitor either yourself and you think, oh, I want to change that or when you monitor your environment, uh, does that change your voting behavior, are you more likely to vote? So, uh, but I'm not going to speak about that bit, uh, but um, yeah, about self-monitoring behavior in a general population because we thought, well, the best way to start, because there hasn't been any research in this field, is to start in a general population. And we were thinking, OK, where can we find uh, trackers? Um, um, yeah, so we were hoping to catch them, but I'll come to that later. And those are, were my research questions. Um, and uh, so what makes people start uh, self-monitoring or self-tracking behavior? And you can think about tracking fitness or health or diet, uh, weight, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, I'll walk you through the results. Uh, I have loads of slides, so I hope I can make it. I'll try to speed it up and just pick out the relevant bits. I have some notes, and if people have questions, I can always discuss it later with you if there are some bits uh, that we didn't refer to. Um, so, um, yeah, basically, what do they start? Why? Uh, how many times per day? Did, do they do it for a long time? Or just recently, uh, what do they use? Uh, do people share their data? Do they think it helps them reach their goals? And for how much is it related to certain clinical variables that I was interested in specifically? So anxiety and then kind of the worrying type. Um, the um, self-esteem, social comparison and competitiveness. And uh, yeah, what was really important to us because there's so much research and there's even another digital health conference I saw in London um, and people uh, self-monitor a lot. But yeah, I haven't found any research uh, so far where people um, yeah, discuss uh, or well, well researchers discuss, you know, how do people experience it? Do they enjoy tracking or do they find it really boring or is it very confrontational? Um, so that was basically what I wanted to know. So, but what do people think of it? Um, so, um, to find some trackers, we thought it's probably in the fitness uh, community somehow. So, we went to sports centers and running clubs in the Edinburgh area. Um, and also, uh, I managed to put an advert in the online newsletter from Parkrun. I don't know if you know that, but that's a free run every Saturday five kilometers and people get a barcode um, and then they can look up their score online and compare it with others. And it's a whole movement uh, throughout the world, actually. I think it started in the, in the UK. But um, anyway, I found 271 people who, um, yeah, who looked at the program uh, on Bristol Online Service and 270 filled it out. Of those 270, uh, there were 259 participants who actually self-monitored something. Um, and uh, I will only use the non-tracking participants uh, in the results. So I'll, I will mention that for the demographics to see if there's any difference. So the results are mainly about the tracking people. Um, uh, these are the things I will discuss, uh, are the things that I will discuss. Um, there's loads more. Uh, below, but uh, the things in red are the ones uh, I will tell you about. Um, so goals and goal importance ask people to um, yeah, write down three of their life goals. So that's not tracking goals, but just life goals and how important they were on a scale from one to five. Then anxiety, self-esteem, quality of life, social comparison, uh, which indicated for how much people thought they were comparing favorably to other people. So just so you know, a higher score is more favorable. And competitiveness had two components. Um, goal competitiveness, which basically meant comparing uh, yourself with your own goals in the past and in the future. And interpersonal competitiveness, comparing your results with uh, those of somebody else. Um, then the demographics, the average self-tracker that uh, took part uh, was white British, early 40s, married or living together. Most were full-time employed, some were part-time employed. And there were slightly more females than males. Um, yeah, I, I, 
estimate there might be more people from Scotland, even though it was online, but it was around the Brexit referendum, uh, no, sorry, not the Brexit, the um, independence referendum. So I did sense that a lot of people felt more Scottish because of that. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's, I don't, I don't know how useful those data are. Uh, okay, um, yeah, this group, uh, and I don't expect this is a good reflection of the whole of the general population, but in this fitness population, people tracked for quite a long time and quite often. Um, uh, about one third had a medical condition uh, and that was the only difference I found uh, with the non-tracking people. For the rest, all the demographics were kind of similar. Uh, and there were was about one fifth had a past mental health condition, but yeah, only a few people reported having a mental health condition currently. So what do self-trackers report as live goals? Um, Next. Yeah, it was um, the three most important ones, which um, were uh, quite uh, to be expected. Fitness, weight or diet, and worker study. And I must explain that uh, most of the data were open questions. So we asked people, what do you, uh, do you self-track and what is it that you self-track? And we'll come later to the questions of what made you start? Were there any live events? Also, those were open questions that I went over and uh, coded for themes. And then I had like 60 themes and then I coded that into another category. And those are the ones that I will compare. So I must em emphasize this is a pilot study and an explorative study. Um, it's, it's no existing measures, but it's to get an idea of where should we do research in, in which areas. Um, but yeah, the face validity should be good because it was people's own answers. Uh, it was quite clear. I'll give you some examples of the answers later. Um, so, um, also looked at approach or avoidance goals. So, um, uh, because that can be important. Uh, avoidance goals you can think of if somebody is really anxious uh, to get an illness later on uh, or has diabetes and doesn't want complications. Uh, that could be an avoidance goal to just make sure that the diabetes doesn't progress too much or uh, not gain too much weight. It is very much in the phrasing. Um, an approach goal would be, I want to be uh, fit. And um, yeah, an avoidance goal would be, I, I don't want to be unfit. It's, it's positive versus negative, mainly. Um, so yeah, just to emphasize, it was, sorry, it was mainly approach goals that people set when they uh, refer to their life goals. So what events made individuals start self-tracking? About half of the people said there was an, uh, a live event that made them start. Um, the ones in uh, the colors are the, the smaller subcategories, um, which were already kind of grouped together of other categories. Um, but yeah, the, the ones in blue are the overarching themes. And again, health and fitness are the most important one. Uh, weight and diet plays a role. Um, for example, uh, somebody got ill in a family would be a live event that made somebody start. Um, and for fitness, it could even be as simple as, oh yeah, I just, uh, I got a smartphone. Uh, and then I started tracking, but those were not that many people that mentioned that as a reason. Um, the interesting thing I thought was that here the avoidance goals were mentioned more, that the life events actually led more to a state of going away from a certain situation than approaching uh, a goal that you want to reach. So why do individuals track? Well, this was a really long list. Um, Again, the, the colored ones are the, the overarching themes, and the ones after it are the, the sub-themes of that. I'll just give you a minute to scan this. And it's hard to summarize this, really. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me for the slide later on if you're interested. Um, so what subjects or behaviors do participants uh, track? Well, fitness, uh, that was to be expected, was the highest one. Um, but the second highest one was finance or car mileage or gas and electricity. And that was not on the list of life goals. Well, it was there somewhere, but it was very low. So that was uh, interesting that people just probably just don't realize that they're tracking that unless you uh, make them sum up their tracking behaviors. Health and diet were kind of similar. Uh, mental health and well-being uh, were not tracked so often. And yeah, again, here are some examples of the subcategories. Uh, then the methods. Um, yeah, digital methods are the most popular. Um, 
So apps, uh, software, uh, but also uh, memory, making notes are still used. Um, and yeah, oh, um, I forgot to mention, I'll come back to that later, but anyway, there were some gender differences that I didn't put on the slide, is that software, use of software and websites, uh, men used that more than uh, women, and apps were used more uh, by women than by men, and uh, I was wondering if that was just the ease of use, if there is some kind of gender difference in that. And um, to go back to this one, the subtext that uh, people track. Um, fitness was more tracked by men, Diet, weight, more tracked by women, and finance and work more tracked by men than women. The next question was, do people share their data? And if so, how do they do that? Um, yeah, over half the people shared their data. Um, uh, surprisingly, um, because you think about sharing data, data is digital, or at least, yeah, that's the connotation it has for me. Uh, but um, yeah, a lot of people shared, uh, uh, yeah, just discussions with friends. and, and um, Social media and online groups are also used, but less than just discussions. And uh, what was interesting is that even though there was, uh, if you can remember, 44% of people tracked health. Uh, I don't know if I, I didn't mention that, but anyway, 44%. But there was really, there were really few people that actually discussed their health tracking with professionals. So uh, how are these demographics related to tracking behaviors? Um, the, yeah, it was, everything was related in a positive way. I'll save you the reading through all the numbers. The only thing that was related in a negative way was age and times tracking per day. So uh, the younger, the more people tracked more often. And um, yeah, health was tracked by people with a medical condition, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, um, you would, yeah, I don't know if there's any conclusion that you can uh, draw from that, but uh, yeah, people, tracked less times per day when they uh, reported more medical problems. Um, yeah, people with a current mental health diagnosis uh, more often tracked health, uh, the more they yeah, said that they would, or when they um, were on mental health medication. Then, um, this is a long one, I will summarize this for you. Uh, this is uh, yeah, a table about the relationships between the subjects that people track, like the health, fitness, etc., and the behavior, so how they, do they do it? Uh, did I say it correctly? Um, no. Yeah. When people track, uh, I'll just summarize from my notes, uh, when people track health, that is most often related to tracking another subject as well. Um, and another uh, relevant finding was that health and fitness, of course, is, is related. People that track health track fitness, uh, it, that goes kind of goes together. Um, and um, what is important is that people that track diet or weight, um, yeah, tend to also take a break from tracking. And um, the lowest uh, row here, when you see that, um, that was a question we had, oh, do you expect to be tracking uh, like in the future? And then people could say, no, I don't think so, maybe, oh, I'm sure, definitely. Um, so taking, taking a break from tracking reduces the chance that you will take it up again, or that you expect to take it up again. So when people uh, that track diet or weight expect to take a break, then it might make it more, easy, uh, more difficult to pick it up again, even though this is not a causal relationship, obviously, but that was what I was thinking to explain. But of course, there's more research needed for that. Uh, then. Uh, the relationships of the subjects that people track with the methods. Uh, basically, to summarize, different subjects use different methods. Uh, yeah, people that track different subjects use different methods for that. Um, and for health, uh, people use memory as well as uh, technology like apps or Fitbits. Uh, people that track fitness are um, less likely to mention uh, memory, to use memory to remember their. Uh, information, and people that track diet or weight usually do it from memory more often. And finance is a combination of memory notes and software. Let's skip through this. And then um, tracking subjects with sharing data. 
health um, was more discussed uh, with others offline, while fitness was basically sh more shared online, and diet and weight was also something that was more shared offline with people. Um, mental health and well-being did not have any significant relationship with uh, sharing of data, and I was wondering, and that is um, the branch of research I'm usually in is about stigma and beliefs about illness. I was wondering if people that track their mental health and well-being share it less because they're more hesitant to do so. But again, more information is needed because I don't have any uh, yeah, information about that from these people. These were the questions um, used to ask, and this, uh, these uh, questions we did develop up front to, yeah, to see how people experience their self-tracking behavior. The people could rate it on a scale from one to five, and five is positive and one is negative. There were a couple of um, negatively phrased questions that are reversed, so the higher score, for example, feels like a chore. Uh, the higher is better, so it feels less like a chore. So, but I'll mention it when we, uh, yeah, uh, when I discussed the results, which ones were the reversed ones for clarity. But basically, you could see that uh, yeah, most uh, were related more positive than, uh, uh, sorry, most um, tracking self-tracking experiences were experienced in a positive way. Yeah, um, I will summarize this. Uh, tracking experiences tend to correlate <laughs> with each other. Um, then I looked at uh, goal importance, and I must emphasize that goal importance was about a general life goal, so not the, the goals that people set for uh, tracking. Um, but there was, um, yeah, uh, an experience, uh, sorry, a correlation with some uh, between some of the uh, goal importance and um, experiences of tracking. And the most important one, I think, is the, the one on the bottom, where um, it says that uh, quantifying things sometimes makes me feel anxious about my goals. This was one of the higher the score, the more positive, so the less anxious. Uh, but that was uh, correlated in a negative way with goal importance. So uh, the more people thought their goal was important to them, the more anxious they reported they uh, would get about their goals when they were self-monitoring. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. usually the relationships between the subjects like health, fitness, uh, finance uh, were associated in a positive way with how people experienced the tracking of these data. Um, the only negative one was uh, tracking diet. Um, because people reported that um, data gathering could make them more stressed when they were tracking their diet or weight. And um, yeah, that could be because maybe um, when people track weight, um, it, it, it can fluctuate a lot and it can be frustrating when they see it doesn't go down. Uh, but again, there's more information needed, but it's useful to know that yeah, it can have a, a negative effect on people. Uh, I wanted to tell you about the relationship between clinical variables and tracking experiences because my uh, one of the questions was does it uh, is it confrontational for people to see um, their results and does anxiety help with that or is it a negative way and does tracking have a negative impact um, this is my final slide yeah Th these are regressions analysis um, and I was looking at uh, yeah, what things help uh, yeah, tracking which, uh, sorry, which clinical variables can help people in the sense that they feel they reach their goals with self-monitoring. And self-esteem and anxiety do predict how people feel uh, it helps them to reach their goals. Uh, there was another slide that I had to skip, but goal, goal competitiveness, so when people compare uh, their own results, uh, past and present, uh, that can also, uh, yeah, be helpful, but it, it is related to anxiety. So that's, there is some link. But anyway, if people want more information, just uh, come to me, and I can always just uh, explain a bit more. But uh, I'm afraid we're out of time.
uh, anxiety could help uh, people reach, uh, give the sense that it helps reach their goals. There was one question about, um, how, uh, yeah, do people enjoy it? Do people feel like uh, that it's a chore? Uh, does self-monitoring help you reach your goals? That was one question, and anxiety oh. helps predict that, self-esteem and anxiety. Okay, and when this, the bottom second last paragraph, anx anxious about my goals, it suggests that it might make them more anxious um, yeah, but this is one of the reverse. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, uh, goal competitiveness, so uh, for how much people um, compare uh, themselves with themselves in the past, uh, that predicts a sense of control, uh, feeling less anxious about their goals, and the sense that it uh, makes them more self-aware. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I noticed from your list of the reasons why people use fitness trackers that um, one said to earn money yeah why why do you do to earn money how can you earn money tell me please it, it was one of the four or five reasons that that person gave um, and apparently by putting data in some kind of software program uh, that person made money off that okay uh, the other thing is um, your your group that you uh, approached park run movement do you not think that they're not they're not a typical group of individuals who use mm -hmm. trackers because I felt that there was a very high number of people sharing data which is I find quite unusual half sharing data with others which actually seems to be contrary to a lot of other studies. Yeah. A lot of people mentioned that sharing data I think it was 36.7 percent sharing data was offline um, and um, I was wondering, how, for how much can you generalize it? Like I said, it's a pilot study and an explorative study, but um, there is a book uh, from 2016 from uh, Neff and... I'll have to look up. Neff and Nevis, um, that mentions um, that uh, the, the people that are kind of trendsetters uh, can be representative of other people. Uh, even if it's a smaller group, but uh, yeah, it, it's hard to say without replicating this. Okay, it is much. definitely a skewed to a population. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So the uh, next person talking is Simon uh, Shepherd. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to last furlong of the race. We will get through this as quickly as we can. Um, I'm going to try and talk about the data of fluffy stuff and the battle for sanity. So by fluffy stuff, I'm going to be talking a bit about, I don't know, sleep, stress, exercise, energy. Um, we might even get onto values and emotions. You never know. Um, by data, I'm going to uh, be drawing on the data set that I have of 1.5 billion data points that maps physiological responses across UK PLC with their behaviours and actions. Um, I, I'm a physiotherapist by background. I'm not highly specialised, but I am a physiotherapist by background. Um, this has been my office for the last 28 years. It's a rather unusual picture of Lord's Cricket Ground because there's some blue sky. Um, a few of the people actually seem to be awake here, so that was probably photoshopped. Um, and this is the sort of site that greeted me when I started back in 1991. That's a picture of a chap called David Boone. He batted number three for Australia, world-class international batsman. There he is, fag in one hand, beer in the other hand. Um, and I use the pictures to actually make me reflect on what has changed in my world in the last 25 years. And if I think of the world in cricket, well, to be honest with you, not a lot has changed. It's still 11 aside. They, they, they batsmen try and score runs. The bowlers try and take wickets. Um, it often attracts the rain, and it can be quite tedious at times. Not a lot has changed in cricket. But if I think what has changed with cricketers in the last 25 years, the answer is masses. The support systems that are now put in place to help people perform at their peak week in, week out, month in, month out, are colossal. And in most dressing rooms in the professional circuit, there'll be more uh, support staff than there will be players. There'll be people to help them with their, their diet, their fitness, their mindset, their technique, their tactics, how to sleep, how to get from A to B, maybe even how to wipe that. Yeah, OK, we might not go there. But there are a lot of people supporting others, and those people need data. Um, uh, and whilst I've done a lot of work in sport, the last five years of my life, I've actually been spending a lot of time working with businesses and the people who work in businesses. And I think it's interesting that businesses are starting to take on a similar approach that people are important. The last 20 years has seen incredible advancement in process and digitization. And I think we're starting to play catch up with people. And I'd like to say businesses are doing it because they love their staff. 
They're very altruistic. Um, maybe they are, um, or maybe they're not. Um, but I suspect they might be led by numbers. So uh, maybe the numbers relate to aging. You know, businesses have challenges with aging as well. Workforce is going to become older. Retirement ages are going to increase. And that is a global challenge. It isn't just on our doorstep. But if people keep becoming unwell at the similar sort of times as they become unwell now in their lives, then ageing is going to be a big issue to employers, not just employees. It will be a big issue for, for societies. And I think governments and HR specialists and economists are starting to realise that ageing is going to impact the workplace as well as everywhere else. It, it may be that there's increasing expenditure on absence. I, I don't know if, if any of you sort of aim to or work in industries that are growing, but gee, this is a good growth industry. Have a look at the amount of money that was spent on workplace stress across Europe in 2002, estimated to be around about 20 billion euros a year. Um, well, that's quite an interesting growth rate when we got to 2013 up at 618 billion. And if you want to understand how that's made up, there are just a few little factors to complete the story. Maybe another reason why businesses are interested in people is that, is that we live in this VUCA world. I'm sure people know what VUCA stands for as an acronym, but for those of you who might not, VUCA stands for volatile, if we imagine what's happening maybe in Syria at the moment, uncertain, complex, how Leicester City won the EPL, I haven't got a clue. If you're looking for a PhD topic, maybe there's a starting point for you. Um, and ambiguous. We live in this VUCA world. Um, and I think businesses are realising that actually there's a lot of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity on their doorstep. And when psychologists go into businesses and ask the question of staffs, what's the most VUCA thing in your world, the most common response is, my colleagues. So I think there's also a realisation that we need to behave better with each other because if we don't, that is going to impact on both our performance, our health and our well-being. And I spend a lot of my time working with businesses um, around this thing, resilience, which seems to be the antidote for stress. It might be a bit of a buzzword. Um, my view is that resilience is the ability to deal with what's going on around you. It's not about being robust and saying yes and taking everything on board. It's about your ability to cope. And I also think that resilience can be broken down to be a skill. And it's a skill that starts with recognition. If you do not stop and think where you're at, the rest actually becomes potluck. And so I really want to spend the rest of this talk talking about recognition and how wearables can help us understand ourselves a bit better. I, I don't believe human beings are very good at creating a very accurate picture of themselves. And this, is, again, is where technology is useful. Um, we're quite good at seeing disasters and catastrophes, and therefore we're quite good at dealing with them. But we're absolutely rubbish at seeing all those things that just creep underneath the surface and pull on our system until one day they become too big. So I'm just going to talk you through the technology that I use and then just show you a few uh, sort of example slides um, and reports. So the technology I use is called a first beat bodyguard. There it is on the left. It's a little wearable. It collects, um, it's, got, it's a tracks accelerometer. It collects heart rate and it collects heart rate variability at 1,000 hertz. So we're, we're talking pretty accurate here. Um, is everyone familiar with heart rate variability and autonomic function? I've got yes, anyone not? There's a no, right, I'm going to give you a very quick physiology lesson. So heart rate variability is a product of our autonomic nervous system. Our autonomic nervous system controls all the things in our bodies that we don't really think about. Our breathing, our blood pressure, our respiratory rate, um, our digestion, our sweating, etc. There are two main branches. There is a sympathetic branch and a parasympathetic branch. Our sympathetic branch is triggered when we are stressed or loaded or need to be alert. Our parasympathetic branch, the opposite. When our sympathetic branch is... Um, Dominant, we tend to release things like adrenaline and cortisol, our blood pressure rises, but our heart starts beating like a metronome. So I could have a heart rate of 60, and our heart would just beat at one beat a second. On the other hand, the parasympathetic branch becomes active when we are in a state of recovery. We release hormones such as DHEA, blood pressure drops, sweat response lowers, and hey presto, we could still have a heart rate of 60, but our heart would beat quickly for 5 or 10 seconds, then slowly for 5 or 10 seconds, quickly for 5 or 10, then slowly. So whilst heart rate is useful, the pattern of the heart rate is even more useful, especially if we're looking at intra-individual change. Okay, cool. So that's what we measure. We measure by looking at the distance between the two R spikes on a PQRST complex, measuring it in milliseconds. Uh, and, and we collect the data for long periods of time. 
And using all these bits of data, we can start to produce a jigsaw, a jigsaw that might look at stress and recovery and uh, resilience. I'm going to show a few more examples of that in a moment, so we'll go there in a second. We, we, we might look at the percentage of recovery over a 24-hour period. We might look at length of sleep, but more importantly, we want to look at the quality of that sleep, because length of sleep, if it's rubbish, is still a waste of time. Um, we will look at physical activity from a health promoting point of view. So we want to actually look at your internal dynamics in terms of your cardiovascular uh, system. Um, we, will, we can look at things such as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption if we want to use this technology with high-end sport, and we do. Um, we can look at energy expenditure with about a 6% error rate. But most importantly, we ask people to complete a diary through their phone whilst they're wearing a monitor so we get the story. Because without context, we don't really know what we're talking about, or we don't know why we might be talking about it. We may have a number that tells us what, but we're not moving to the next question, which is why. So we collect lots of numbers, I guess is what I'm saying, and then we produce charts. There's a 24-hour chart. That's a city trader. The red color is when the person is in a state of sympathetic dominance. There is not an axis on. There is not a unit of measurement on the y-axis. So the higher the red, the more stressed or loaded you are, and I don't think stress or load is a bad thing, as long as it's not all the time. Uh, this turquoise colour is when the person is in a state of parasympathetic dominance. The blue is when they are physically active or highly anxious. So we've got a high heart rate here as well. So this person went to the gym here, physical load. They've had a tough day at work. They've gone to bed just before midnight. They've gone straight into parasympathetic dominance. I'd be pretty happy if that was me over a 24-hour period. This is the same person the very next day. The only recovery they get is between 5.30 and 6.30 in the morning. They went to sleep. No, they didn't go to sleep there. They went to sleep at exactly the same time as the night before. So although they're resting, they're not restoring. This is a really obvious example. This person took clients out for dinner, two-thirds of a bottle of wine and ate late. So mental engagement all day and all evening. They have to deal with the toxicity of the alcohol and they have to digest the food that was taken on board late. From this data, we can start to draw a resilience line or a battery line. This, this uh, line always starts in the midpoint of the y-axis. It will go down when the person is in the red or the blue color. The gradient of the line will be in proportion to the physiological response. So you can see on day one, this person's batteries ran down. They do for most of us. That's why we go to bed at night. We're tired. But you can see the recovery was effective and started to balance the books. On day two, the batteries have gone down, but have stayed down. So I think you can imagine what's going to happen to this person's ability to think straight, community, communicate well, maintain good body language, lead effectively, etc., etc. So that's a very obvious example, but what we see a bit more often is this. It's what I call the dripping tap effect. There are three days of data put back to back, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you can see how every day the battery's just gone down a bit, and then a bit more, and then a bit more. So you can see where this person's going to be come the weekend. So we should be all right, because we've got the weekend to recover, haven't we? Trouble is, when we looked at the first 20,000 days of data, which was the toughest day of the week? Oh, it was Saturday. When we have the opportunities to recover, we don't always take them. I can only put anecdote behind that, but maybe our social excesses go to certain places. But maybe work isn't as stressful as we think it is. We have job descriptions, we have colleagues, we have targets, we have goals, we have structure. Do we ever have that in any other aspect of our life? Some people do, but some people don't. But the weekends also give us opportunity for this thing to go all over the place. And sometimes that can be dangerous. Um, two other examples I just do want to show you. This is uh, uh, an example where someone used the right ingredients in the wrong way. This is a uh, person who came to see me with a bad back. They told me about their back for 20 seconds. They told me about their life for 20 minutes. So as a physio, I had option A, go push, 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 click, 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 bend your knees when you lift, etc., etc. Or should we look at something a bit different? So I put a monitor on him, and you can see he's doing hard exercise for an hour and a quarter just before bed. He was uh, working for a bank that was just about to collapse just about eight years ago. And uh, he said, yeah, no, I've, I've been reading about physical activity. I've heard it's really good for mental health and uh, physical health. I've gone out. I've bought myself a punch bag. And every night I go home, and I just beat the out of the punch bag. But of course, exercise is a stimulant. Wrong time, wrong dosage, and you can see what happens with sleep. So we stopped him doing that at that time of day and his back got better. How many of you exercise in the evening? Anyone? Yeah, a few people. So what I want to say here is make the point, don't not exercise. And you know what? Don't not exercise in the evening if that's the only opportunity you have to do it. 
If netball on at nine o'clock on a Thursday night is the only chance to play netball, go and do it. But think, if that's a non-negotiable in my day, where are the negotiables that I'm going to balance the books? Should I have my main meal in the middle of the day? Should I maybe have a snack halfway through the afternoon? Should I prehydrate as opposed to rehydrating? Should I get everything ready for work before I go out to netball rather than afterwards? Or am I just going to come back and get everything organised, eat and overhydrate? Just before bed. So where I do find this technology useful is opening up the conversations about the negotiables and the non-negotiables the one has in a day and obviously can change day on day. But you will only understand them if you start with recognition. And the last example I want to show you before I look at some aggregated data is of a cancer nurse. Um, this, my perception was uh, she has to do a really, really, really tough clinic once a week. And my perception was this was going to be the most stressful time of her week. And her perception was that's going to be the most stressful time of my week. And that's her doing the clinic. She's in a state of total parasympathetic dominance. <coughs> And the more I do this, the more I see when people are doing things that are closely aligned with their values, are closely aligned uh, with their learning, in an environment they're happy with colleagues that they get on with, we often see it physiologically. And of course, when people are doing totally the opposite to that, we often see that too. I've seen people in HR sacking people in that colour. Why? Because in 15 minutes' time, the monkey that's been firmly on my back for the last three months putting this case together is going to be off it. I've seen doctors who have a split workload between dealing with patients and doing uh, research in academia, who love academia. When they're doing the patients, they're going off the Richter scale when it goes stress response, and yet when they're actually doing their research, they're nicely in this place here. So wearables could also give us a bit of an insight in what makes us tick. Um, where have we got to? Oh, yeah, we also ask people questions before they wear the wearables. So they're just very 10 very simple questions. I just picked two out here. So one of the questions I feel I sleep enough. Well, this was a group of about 500 people we did this with last year, um, where 39% of the people went, uh, yeah, I sleep enough, which means a heck of a lot of people don't think they sleep enough. But when we looked at the objective data, oh, actually, it was the other way around. So it's interesting how people sort of um, relate to the fashion industry, as I call it, because there's been a lot about not getting enough sleep recently in the press, hasn't there? And the other one is, the question we ask is, I feel I get enough activity to be healthy. Not be fit, but just be healthy. Again, one that people grossly overestimate with 46% of people thinking, yes, I do do enough physical activity to be healthy, but when we actually look at the objective data, no, hardly anyone at all. So I, I, I do find the data a really, really useful tool, but I'm afraid there is a caveat here. And the caveat is that for all the data that we have, and we have a lot of it, so what? What are you going to do with it? So unless data is accompanied by some form of education or coaching or support mechanism, we do not see the end results. Here's an example. This was a group of NHS workers that we monitored about five years ago. Um, some it was quite an interesting project because there were about 80 people in this project. And, uh, we, we monitored them and we just spotted that there are about 15, 20 who didn't come along to any of the sort of workshops we ran alongside it. And we logged those people and then we, when we re-monitored them, which was four months after we finished the program, it was quite interesting. Those who did actually bother getting, coming along to those little half-hour Feel Good Friday, I think it was called, education sessions, the results were so much better than those that just got the data in isolation. And whether it's an education program, whether it's a coaching session, I do think there needs to be something or another layer on top of just data and the wearable approach. So um, just how does this help people? A couple of examples and I'll finish. This is a head of risk for a global uh, organisation. That was their data when we first monitored them. A um, bit of a nightmare, really. The conversation went a bit like this. So what's missing in your life? Oh, I don't know. What do you mean, what's missing in my life? No, what's missing? What do you love doing? What do, you... do you know what? I love exercising. Well, tell me more about that. Yeah, no, I love roller skating. Tell me more about that. When did you last do it? I lasted it about five months ago. Why haven't you done it recently? I'm not really sure. How does it make you feel when you do it? I feel great. You know, we went on classic te coaching technique. So this person committed that they, would ex that they would start roller skating again, and this was their data six weeks later. 
Okay, they're doing physical activity, that helps, but do you know what I believe helps even more? Doing something I love. Does it help organisations? Because ultimately, organisations aren't so interested in helping their people doing things they love. They're interested in uh, doing things like working with optimism and energy and going above and beyond their job description to achieve results and being committed to achieving team goals and constantly adapting from adversity to overcome obstacles. Well, the data would suggest that that was quite positive too. So I'll just leave you with four thoughts as a summary. For me, accuracy is important. Accuracy is critical. And I believe that there may well be almost an antagonistic approach if we do not improve the accuracy of our messaging to people. I don't mind if a device has a 60% error rate, which some devices will have around sleep, as long as the device manufacturer says, this has a 60% error rate. But if we overpromise people something and then it doesn't deliver, there's a high chance there will be an antagonistic approach to it. I'd also like to make the point, really backing up the point that was made earlier, well-being is not linear, it is context-driven. If we do not gather the context, it doesn't mean that people aren't improving. Is an improvement in someone's VO2 max important? Well, maybe it is. An improvement in the number of steps they take? Maybe it is. But I think a better objective marker is, I feel I have a better understanding of me. I feel I have a better understanding of the tools that are going to make me healthier and happier. I think those are much better outcome markers. I do believe that data needs to be backed up with the contextual um, analysis, which I've said. And I also think that we need to piece together data as a jigsaw and move away from a siloized approach which looks at just purely exercise or diet or sleep. But how do they all interact? Because do you know what? Your life changes on a daily basis. And if you want to take ownership of your life, you need to think of how the jigsaw fits together on a daily basis. Um, that's my lot. And I think I did it in time. So there you go. Thank you very much. If anyone wants any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And if anyone wants to get in touch, there's the email. And there's a, uh, what's that one called? Is that, is, I think that might be Twitter, isn't it? I never quite know these things. Any questions? I was interested in your method about how you use the, the video diary. Uh, we don't necessarily video it, we, but there's oh. an online, there's, there's a link, yeah. there's an email that comes through, and you just can go in and out whenever you want to, and you write down things like, oh, a really tricky question during a presentation, <laughs> and that will, that will feature on your report. So when you get your report, it will say, underneath your data, really tricky question during presentation. So when, can you talk a little bit more about that? When they've got this um, thing that they're wearing, this monitor, yeah. When are they prompted? Does it prompt them to? No. And so they just, they just enter stuff as, it, as they're thinking about yeah, it? Yeah, they might enter it retrospectively. They might enter it when they're thinking. We, you know, when, when in the instructions, we'll sort of tell people to put down what they want. You know, some people will put down some, a record every 10 minutes. Some people will just put work, rest, sleep. And that's all they'll do. Some people are really interested in diet, so they'll put in dietary markers like I had a treble espresso. Some people will, you know, put in sat in a traffic jam. We only get people to wear the monitors for probably between three and seven days typically. It isn't a continual three, six, five days a year monitoring system. You about how important the, the why is. Do you think you collected enough data through those um, little things that people typed in to give you a sense of the why? I think we do get a why for the three or four or five days that we collect for and that opens up the conversation for longer term viewpoints. Life changes. So it's important to think of why is this happening maybe at the moment with obviously retrospective viewpoints of why you think like that and potentially futuristic viewpoints of where you want to get to. But I think the why is, is a useful question. I do think we collect enough data um, to open up some good conversations. Thanks, Simon. Um, just interested in sports people and yeah. potentially maybe elite athletes. Um, so you, you say you're only sort of tracking between three and seven days. Yeah. With elite sports people, do you track for longer? Yeah. So, so the technology originated with endurance athletes where we're looking at fatigue syndrome um, and overtraining syndrome, which is obviously a balance of either doing too much exercise or too little recovery or a combination of the two. And with sports people, one would... Now, for example, my, the fast bowlers that I look after at Lords, I would look to track them on a... Uh, weekly basis, just one day a week. Okay. 
and then we would look at trends. And, you know, there's some times when we do want to fatigue them. If pre-season we were looking for a super compensation effect, we'd want to get a degree of fatigue in their system. But you get good buying because you've got data. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I haven't shown all this stuff around the sport and, and a lot of the training effect reports that we can produce around that. And then that influences practice volumes and loads. I'm yeah, assuming. it will influence training loads. It will influence travel strategy. So in Formula One, for example, um, there were some interesting projects done with the people, uh, the pit crews, um, because the pit crews potentially win or lose you the race. And if the person isn't in good nick and they're trying to change a tyre in 1.7 seconds on a Sunday afternoon, they're struggling. So some of the Formula One teams use this data to understand the recovery responses and then program the travel of the pit crews accordingly. So some people might get to a race venue a day earlier than other people just because they know they need a bit more recovery. But if their data's not right, you do not change the tile on a Sunday. Hello, and thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I've got a very, um, just, I've got a practical question to ask about the device. Uh, so you show the device and it's a two-piece device um, stuck on the chest of a very well-shaven man. There. It's one I did earlier, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's just uh, stuck on the body for three to five days yeah. with a wire in between. Yeah. How does that affect wearability and when you're wearing it? during the day and during sleeping hours and yeah sometimes people toss and turn and, and thrash about and a wire becomes loose and if that happens that's unfortunate we get poor quality data but we report it as poor quality data we won't pretend that we've actually got good good data to be honest with you most people it's not everyone but most people go do you know what five minutes after i was wearing it i didn't know i was wearing it it's 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 very light and unobtrusive people who react sensitive on skin with with electrodes well we have to change electrodes regularly. We might reduce the length of the time they wear them for. We might try a hypoallergenic electrode. But accuracy is important, and that's why we go for that site rather than here or anywhere else. It will come. Optical pulses here will come, but it's, they're not good enough in terms of heart rate variability yet. I think that's a really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, do you find people come to you because they think they have a problem or and of, of wanting a solution or are you finding people are interested because they just want to know how their well-being is? Uh, a bit of both. Um, so, uh, and it got, partly goes back to the comments I made earlier. I'm a big believer in a solutogenic approach and that's how I would position this technology as something that helps you be a bit better a bit more often. Now, sometimes you might be unwell, isn't necessarily about really high performance, but actually, if you're unwell, I do want to be a bit better a bit more often. So I would consider it to be a salutogenic tool and a salutogenic approach more than a pathogenic one, although I do think there's some really interesting opportunities to look at some of those diseases that wax and wane, things like MS, Parkinson's, chronic fatigue, rheumatoid arthritis. Could we pick up an early fatigue marker, which is potentially the thing that's going to trigger an exacerbation and could lead to early intervention? I think I'd better shut up yeah. on that. No, it's all right. No, it's very interesting. I get scary when people start creeping. <laughs> scared when people start creeping towards me. me sure. Moderators. Are there any other questions? I was going to ask one, but I'll maybe do it in private later. Okay. Um, right. Thank well, you thank you very much uh, for that uh, that talk. I thought uh, the, the last three have been really very good indeed. What I'd like the audience to do is to show their appreciation for Joe and Elizabeth uh, and Simon's contribution to the wear first wearable tech um, sessions. Right, so this is the end of the formal part of the day. Um, I think we've got an hour until the networking social event and book launch in the OU Hub. Is that right? Yes, um, that's when the briefing says that the hub, the area in the hub will be open. So if you wanted to go over there and see the hub, I think there should be drinks available until um, any time from now. Which bit of the hub? It's in the um, Medler and Jim. Okay, all right. So um, if you want to pack up your stuff, and we'll lead you over there. Right.